Hello, and welcome to another episode of Trust and Trade, a podcast produced by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Trust and Trade is a podcast for seasoned practitioners interested in deep dives into the areas of competition, consumer protection, and privacy law, and casual listeners who want to better understand some of the most important precedents, principles, and legal decisions in these fields. Each episode is presented by one of the specialty committees within the section. This episode is produced and co-hosted by the Trial Practice Committee of the Antitrust Law Section. This season on Trust and Trade, we'll be partnering with the Trial Practice Committee to bring you first-hand accounts of some of the most important antitrust and consumer protection cases in recent memory, as told by the lawyers and judges who litigated them. We begin our oral history series with today's episode on a watershed antitrust price-fixing case, U.S. versus AU Optronics, known more informally as the LCD Screens litigation. Joining me today is my co-host is Anna Pletcher, a partner at O'Melveny & Myers LLP, and a former assistant chief in the U.S. Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. Anna, nice to have you back this season. Great to be here, Anant. Thank you so much. Anna, what was the AU Optronics case about? AU Optronics, or AUO, is a Taiwanese company that makes liquid crystal displays, or LCDs. These are the screens that are in our phones, laptops, and televisions. Back in 2006, the DOJ's Antitrust Division uncovered a worldwide price-fixing cartel involving the biggest names in this sector, including LG, Hitachi, Sharp, Samsung, and during the course of the investigation, most of the major manufacturers pleaded guilty along with several top executives. And this was the norm at the time, given the DOJ's track record in court, because up to that point, I think it had been years since the Antitrust Division had taken a corporate defendant to trial in a criminal case. That's right. But with one notable exception, AUO chose to fight the charges at trial. And on March 13, 2012, after an eight-week trial in the federal district court in San Francisco, the company and two former executives were found guilty. Two executives were acquitted, and the jury couldn't reach a verdict on the fifth executive charged. On retrial, that fifth executive was convicted. The third trial involved a single executive individual who was acquitted. And at sentencing, AUO was fined a record tying $500 million and required to complete three years of probation, including a monitorship. Two executives were sentenced to three years in prison and the third to two years. This case has been described as one of the most important ones in the history of the division's cartel enforcement and amnesty program. What makes this case so important? The decision and the sentence had several historic firsts. The first had to do with how the size of the monetary harm was calculated. The second was how the case decided the extraterritorial reach of the Sherman Act. And the third and fourth involved unique aspects of the sentence. First, the imposition of an external compliance monitor as part of the remedy and requiring the company to take out large advertisements in major publications acknowledging its guilt. Those things had never happened before. And we're going to be discussing those things today with our guests. And who do we have with us today? We have four guests. We are privileged to welcome senior United States District Court Judge Susan Ilston. Judge Ilston presided over all three criminal trials and also handled the related sprawling multi-district civil litigation. We're also joined by two former antitrust division prosecutors who tried the three AUO trials, Heather Inyongo and Brent Snyder, who are both now in private practice. And finally, Patrick Robbins is joining us. At the time, he was a partner at Sherman and Sterling, and he represented AUO sales executive Richard Bai and co-represented AUO president and CEO LJ Chen. Both Mr. Chen and Mr. Bai were acquitted at trial. One of the things that made this trial unique was the strength of the evidence. Heather, can you start us off by talking about an overview of the prosecution's case? Sure. This came to us through the division's leniency program. And it actually, before we even went overt, we already had people coming in and, and wanting to cooperate in order to get uh, credit for that cooperation. So before we even executed search warrants, which was about six months down the line, we had what are called crystal meeting notes. The C and LCDs is liquid crystal displays. And uh, the participants in these meetings were over the course of five years, 60 meetings in total. And we had notes that were in, in Chinese as well as in Korean from our cooperators. 
the very first crystal meeting note, I remember repeating it over and over again in the opening statements. And Judge Ilson has heard it a thousand more times than I have because she had to hear it over and over again in the civil trials. But the very first crystal meeting notes were just days after 9-11 and there was turmoil in the market. And so everyone got together and said, there's turmoil, let's, let's stabilize the market and let's go ahead and agree to, to pricing. And they talked about an, analogizing it to a car race where you put up the yellow flag and everyone starts to slow down and be in unison together. And so those were, of course, excellent, excellent notes. E- excellent. It was almost like a wiretap on the conspiracy over the course of the five years. What was even more incredible was that uh, after we executed the search warrant on AUO America, AUO's uh, U.S. offices in Houston, we received notes of the crystal meetings that were contemporaneous notes taken in English by Stephen Leung, who was eventually convicted at trial. I think he was wanting to impress his bosses and show his English acumen. And so we have uh, notes, we had notes at the time that were in English that said, we all reached a consensus to raise the price of the 15-inch panel by $5, a 12.1-inch panel by $3.5, and so on. So we didn't have to have, to have those debates about the translation because we had those notes in English saying that they had reached an an agreement or a consensus, even though we did have a bit of a debated trial about whether consensus means agreement. uh, But I think that um, the common sense of the jury believe that it was uh, clearly an agreement. How common is it, Heather, in your experience to see such explicit evidence written down of an agreement like that between competitors? I defer to Brent, who in his position, he probably has more insight than I do, but I think it's incredibly uncommon, especially after I would say the LCD cases became so public. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we spread that even more through our sentencing. But I will say as a defense attorney, I'm quite pleased that <laughs> folks are not as explicit in their note taking any longer. But yeah, I think that kind of evidence, I'm not sure if we'll ever see it again. Yeah, I would add that that we had an embarrassment of riches in that case from a prosecutorial standpoint, because we had crystal meeting minutes from multiple companies that pretty much all said the same thing, even though they were translated. The translations matched the ones we had in English. Then you had a lot of the other kind of important evidence from a prosecutorial standpoint, different types of consciousness of guilt evidence. People would write delete after reading or highly confidential on emails where they would be given competitor pricing information and things like that. There, In the crystal meeting notes, there were directions to the group to leave. And there was a warning in at least one set of notes or two sets of notes about different DOJ criminal investigations that were going on of other industries like the DRAM industry. And then there was also an act of obstruction by a an executive of AUO as well. So you had all the consciousness of guilt on top of all of the contemporaneous notes that said that there were agreements. Judge Ilson, what were your initial impressions of the strength of the government's case? The government had a very strong case. In addition to what Brent and Heather have said, I also recall that there was an actual meeting between CEOs at a golf course. So it had all the the classics that you dream about in a case like this. The the meetings had agendas, which spelled out what they were going to do. They had minutes thereafter, which spelled out what they did. Several of them had little lines so that the CEOs could check off that they had actually read these things after they happened. So it was just an ideal kind of set of facts. They had they didn't have their meetings at their offices. They had their meetings in hotels and they would have misleading signs in the hallway to say what was going on, Korean barbecue to the left rather than price fixing meeting. It was um, really quite dramatic. There's really to, in my experience never been anything like it. And of course I had I had hundreds of civil cases that followed on the criminal case and they were they were ecstatic. Patrick, you are the defense attorney facing this mountain of evidence, and you represented individual executives in this case. What was your defense strategy? I'm the designated defense lawyer on this panel, I'm, <laughs> and I'm going to dissent a little bit. 
I actually didn't think the evidence against the AUO individuals was all that strong. Two of my clients were acquitted. Another defendant was acquitted. I would say it, <laughs> the star witnesses that the government put on were from the companies that organized and led the conspiracy and made the most money. And some of their witnesses weren't all that consistent. In the last trial we did for Mr. Bai, one of those witnesses from one of the biggest companies basically recanted. I do think you have to balance uh, the retrospective with the fact that half of the individuals were acquitted who were charged. Now, having said that, the government put on a great case. Heather and Brent tried, uh, I think, three cases and did a wonderful job. And the fine and the corporate convictions were groundbreaking. So I see that balance. But in retrospect, when half the defendants get acquitted, it does send a mixed message to future uh, conspirators in the cartel context. That's an important point, Patrick, that distinction between the corporate prosecution and the individual prosecution. The individual defendants who came over to the U.S. to stand trial were all foreign nationals. What was the thinking there in coming over to the U.S. to stand trial? I can give you the perspective for the two individuals that I represented. And I, again, give the government, not to heap too much praise on them, some credit for this, because I think it really advanced their international prosecution programs. These Taiwanese nationals all came to the United States voluntarily. They put their trust and faith in the integrity of the American criminal justice system and thought they would get a fair trial. Then, and that's a big deal, especially looking back 10 years later. It, it's an important thing uh, for all of us to, to remember. It's really unique because they were out on bail. They came and went from Taiwan. If I recall correctly, one of the very senior people who was facing prison time and got it went home before sentencing and then came back and reported to one of the FCIs. So that's pretty significant because my recollection is before this trial, most foreign nationals who were indicted by the United States came here in handcuffs and stayed that way until trial. I think it's worth noting that they not only had confidence in the American criminal justice system, but also in the American economy because they were heavily invested in it. They had children who were in uh, college and in graduate school in this country. They had in, they had uh, real estate in this country and other investments in this country. So there would have been uh, consequences to them individually had they not cooperated in the way that they did. I'm going to shift to a different topic at this point and dive into some of the unique aspects of this case that have had a lasting impact on the enforcement and of criminal antitrust in the U.S., Starting with this concept of an overcharge, this has to do with the size of the harm to the U.S. consumers based on the price fixing that was proven in this case. Let's start with Heather. And Heather, can you explain to our listeners what an overcharge is? Sure. So typically in a per se criminal antitrust case, uh, unlike the civil plaintiffs, the government does not have to prove the effect or the size of the effect. Instead, there's a proxy that is given under the sentencing guidelines. All the government has to show is the volume of commerce. And then by proxy, it's determined what sort of the overcharge likely was of the conspiracy. We had a sort of a, in, an interesting situation here where the fine maximum under the statute is $100 million. So in order to get above $100 million under 3571, we had to actually prove the overcharge. We also, we felt, and I think Judge Ilson felt, we should go ahead and prove that overcharge given that this was a foreign-based conspiracy, although we were clear that there were U.S. effects. But because the conduct was overseas, the production was overseas, we had a FTAIA issue that we had to deal with. And so the judge in her ultimate determination on what that really means and what we had to prove was that we did have to show an effect on U.S. commerce. And under Hartford Fire, Supreme Court case, it had to be a substantial effect, which we went ahead and did at trial. We showed over $26 billion of volume of commerce. And then we had to use economists to prove the actual sort of overcharge of the conspiracy overall. And then we had a battle of the experts 
because of course, AUO put on its economist. And that was also an interesting wrinkle because we had to prove, we felt, and I think believe Judge Ilson felt uh, that under Apprendi, and just to make sure we had belt and suspenders, we should prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was an overcharge here. And doing that, we all were a little bit concerned about that because when you have a battle of the experts, we were a little bit concerned about it injecting reasonable, a reasonable doubt into the proceedings. And ultimately, I do think that the liability evidence was so strong. The jury was with us. Such they saw the merits of our expert analysis on overcharge, but it was an important thing for the government. It was a very important thing that we were able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was an overcharge here in order to protect the overall mission of our program. And maybe that's more for Brent can talk about that given his role after the AUO trial. Right. Brent, can you take that on? And and so you were the DAAG, affectionately known as the DAG, which is the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the criminal practice in the U.S. Antitrust Division. So you do have a perspective on how the overcharge affected enforcement in the future. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm happy to address that. The one thing I think I wanted to just add to Heather's prior answer, just from a kind of a trial standpoint, is that the overcharge issue really shaped the approach that we took to the trial. Because we were going to have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, we were concerned that the jury might get the issue of liability confused with the issue of the overcharge. And if they concluded that there was uh, a reasonable doubt about the overcharge, they might incorrectly decide that meant there was a reasonable doubt about liability as well. And initially, when we were dealing with issue pretrial, we had moved to bifurcate the issue of the overcharge from the liability finding. And the defendants actually, you know, they opposed that. And Judge Elston ultimately agreed that the two issues should be tried together. I think in retrospect, that played a big part in why the government was ultimately able to prove the overcharge, because it put the defendants in a situation where when they put their expert on a trial, the expert kind of had to choose between giving expert testimony that evidence, the evidence that we had put forward was inconsistent with the existence of the charge conspiracy, or that expert could take on the overcharge issue and say, the government's, the government's overcharge is inflated. But it's hard to do that both at the same time to contest liability, but then pivot and say, if we are liable, the the government's overcharge is too great. And so ultimately, the the defense expert chose the first path. He chose to contest liability. And then he really took himself out of the overcharge testimony. So in the end, I think our expert who put forward our, our expert opinion that there was an overcharge of at least $500 million dollars, essentially was undisputed. And I think if that expert had done the opposite and pivoted and really took on the overcharge case, they might have had a better shot. I still think probably because we took a very conservative approach to what we claim the overcharge to be, that we probably could still have won it. But I think it would have been a lot tougher had the expert for the defendants focused on the overcharge rather than on liability. Patrick, From the defense perspective, how did you feel about the government's arguments regarding the size of the economic harm in this case? On FCAIA, we didn't litigate that for our two clients. The company took the laboring oar on that in the first trial. And frankly, for Richard Bayh's trial, we took a very different, simplified approach. We didn't put on an economist. We put on a summary witness whose job was to explain that prices went down for the product Richard Bayh was responsible for. And I thought that was more effective. I do think jurors understand... um, economists and this the complex amount of information that gets put in front of them, but it's really a morass. It's a morass for both sides and the jury. Let me ask you, Judge Olson, you heard arguments from both the prosecution and defense on how the harm should be calculated. What made the government's argument compelling to you? As Heather indicated, we were in uncharted territory, really, because of the FTAIA issues. If you want to get bogged down, we can talk about the FD, FTAIA at length now, but it was a relatively unexplored statute. It's a statute that's almost indecipherable in terms of the the language chosen. It is full of double negatives, 
And it makes it really hard to know what they were getting at. But to the extent we could figure that out, it seemed to me that part of it was to demonstrate that there was significant consequence in the in this country of what had happened overseas. So it it made more sense that the both those issues should be the liability and damages effectively should be tried together. And I do think that uh, that probably assisted the jury in in coming to its decisions in that both sides buoyed up the other. There's an intuitive understanding that if you fix prices up, there's going to be an over overcharge. Certainly, that's what they were trying to do in the crystal meetings. So the the effect of that was buoyed up, I think, by having the economic information in the in the trial. And of course, I had at the same time as these criminal matters, I had hundreds of civil cases pending, all of which were going to involve similar kinds of proof. From my point of view, it was just all coming in for purposes of the triers of fact. Uh, the other thing I, I will mention now about the FTAIA, and we can come back to it if you like, is that was an area where uh, after we got to trial and realized this matter was going to go to the jury, then the lawyers on both sides got together and assisted in devising jury instructions on the FTAIA issues that it was very helpful to the court that they did that because there was nothing out there on this issue. But also, I think it was they were good instructions. They were clear instructions, and they helped the jury understand where they needed to go with that. Uh, it could have been a nightmare had they not done such a good job, and they did do that good job on it. So I, that was one high point for me in an otherwise very contentious set of cases. Some background for our listeners who are not as steeped in the Sherman Act intricacies as our panel is. The FTAIA is the Foreign Trade Antitrust Improvement Act, and its purpose was to define the extraterritorial reach of the Sherman Act. In other words, to define how far U.S. laws could extend to actions that occurred overseas but impacted U.S. consumers. And that line is shifting. And this case was one of the watershed moments where this statute was actually explored in depth. And the panelists we have today know more about the FTAA than maybe even the folks who originally drafted it. But that is what the FTAA is. I want to jump back to Brent at this point and circle back to talk about the effect of proving this overcharge in the AUO trial on subsequent enforcement. What are your thoughts on that point, Brent? It was really important. Up to that point, through I, from maybe the mid-2000s through the mid-20-teens, the antitrust division had a string of really large investigations, large international investigations where they were routinely getting guilty pleas from companies that far exceeded the statutory maximum $100 million. And, you know, embedded within those was the implicit concession by the defense that they thought we could prove an overcharge if the case actually went to trial. And so so companies were voluntarily agreeing to, to fines, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Obviously, with the AUO case that happened right in the middle of some of these really large investigations like the auto parts investigation, it was following right on the heels of the big air cargo and DRAM investigations that had huge fines. And we were just about to start another large international cartel investigation involving capacitors. And the concern was if we don't win that issue, all of a sudden companies will either stop agreeing to fines above $100 million, or probably even if they agreed to plead, they would want to have a contested sentencing if the division was going to seek a fine above $100 million. So obviously, the division wanted to avoid that. And by taking that issue on in the AUO case, they, they put their credibility on the line and their ability to continue to exact those sorts of fines from companies. Luckily, they were successful 
Now, the irony of it is that I think fines uh, the magnitude that we're talking about in this investigation have been few and far between since. And that's just been the nature of, I think, some of the investigations that have been brought. Although there was at least the the Forex investigation where fines were in the multiple hundreds of millions of dollars for some financial institutions. But for purposes of the ability of the division to continue to get those sorts of fines in negotiated pleas, it was tremendously important. Let's talk about a different aspect of this case that was also unique, and this is also related to sentencing, compliance monitors. Today, we see compliance monitors commonly in white-collar corporate matters, but 10 years ago, those monitorships were relatively rare. In fact, AUO was the first company ever, I believe, to be required to use a monitor in an antitrust case. So this started from the government's proposing the compliance monitor as part of the sentencing. Heather or Brent, whoever wants to start, why did you choose to request one in this case? I think for a number of reasons, but the main one was that even after conviction, AUO's US entity, AUO America, and frankly, many of the executives, certainly those acquitted and even those convicted, they continued to refuse, in our view, to refuse to accept responsibility uh, for this conspiracy. And we were concerned about whether or not they could move forward and engage with the U.S. economy in a compliant manner. And we felt like we needed to uh, go through the effort of coming up with not only a, a compliance monitor request to Judge Ilson, but also a very sort of a, a very robust framework for what a compliance program should look like. The antitrust division, whereas the criminal, crim fraud in particular of the Department of Justice has always had a lot of those things in place. It was rather new for the antitrust division, and now it's absolutely commonplace. But back then, requiring compliance programs, certainly requiring a compliance monitor was a new thing for us. So we we were just took it on fully, and we engaged with engaged with the compliance monitor community to learn more about it. And then I think we put forward a very strong case for why one was needed. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that at the time that the decision was made within the division to potentially seek a compliance monitor, that was something we still had to clear up through the Justice Department. And I was a little surprised at the time to find out that this was going to be the first time that a compliance monitor was ever sought in a contested sentencing. As far as people in the deputy attorney general's office were aware, anywhere in the Department of Justice, which was different than where you would normally see them. Heather had mentioned the the criminal division in connection with FCPA investigations and other types of investigations like the LIBOR investigation. If companies were entering into deferred prosecution agreements, they were routinely having to accept uh, compliance monitors, but it was a voluntary acceptance. This was a little bit different because we were seeking it from a company that was going to resist it and probably resist the actual work of the compliance monitor. And, um, you know, to some degree that happened here because I um, became the criminal deputy maybe a, a few months after the last trial. I ended up staying in in contact with the monitor and it was very unusual. It was unusual for the probation department because they're not used to really dealing with corporate pleas, generally corporate probations, and then add a monitor on top of that. So this monitor, he had his work cut out for him. He had a company that wasn't going to be helpful to him. And he had a probation department that I think really made an effort, but this wasn't their standard practice. And it, It took a while for him to start getting through with them, through to the company. Initially, there was a lot of resistance. Eventually, they came around because what was initially a three-year monitorship, we ended up being able to have extended to five years because of some non-compliance issues and a lack of cooperation with the monitor. And it was ultimately, I think, around the time that they got this extended another two years that they finally started to play ball a little bit with the monitor. But again, it set a really important precedent. I'm still not sure that they're that common in antitrust cases as opposed to other types of criminal cases. I thought they would be more common. And frankly, I think if companies would take the division to trial and lose, uh, I think they're more likely to get one than a company that pleads guilty. 
Why did you believe an ongoing monitor was necessary? Uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, we haven't addressed this much this morning, but this was an inter international case which involved more than just complicated law. It involved different companies with different cultures coming from different paradigms of, of business activity. And in, in some ways, there was um, a naivete about the evidence in our AUO case because uh, you, you got the feeling that these folks wouldn't have recorded everything the way they did unless they thought this was more or less an okay way to do business. There were the indicia, what do you call them, consciousness of guilt suggestions here and there. But by and large, they were writing down on paper what they were going to discuss, and then they wrote down on paper what they did discuss, and they challenged one another when people weren't meeting the goals that they had set. They were behaving as if this was a perfectly logical thing to do and a perfectly okay thing to do. And particularly in the LCD context, where the it was a new industry, it was a new science, they were building factories that were multi-billion dollar factories to build, to make those kinds of investments, the executives felt they needed to have a steady income stream. And post 9-11, everything was in chaos. So there was a lot of logic to what they were doing. And I think it was culturally consistent with the way many of these companies had come up. That being the case, simply to be told you can't do that is one thing, but to have somebody work with you to make sure that these international strictures are acknowledged on a going forward basis seemed to me to be important, more so than if it had been just a set of U.S. companies involved. It was a matter of understanding that, that these kinds of behaviors could not be continued. So that was part of it. Part of it also was that by then, in other areas of uh, U.S. law, these, mon these monitors and compliance had become much more common. There were a lot of times when, for example, in, in Title VII cases with large companies and suspect employment practices where monitors would come in and insist and assist the companies in bringing policies around to make sure that they were consistent with the law. So it was, it felt to me much like that, and it felt like it would actually be useful for the company to have this assistance. Another aspect of the sentence that I found really interesting was that AUO was required to place full-page print ads in a number of major trade publications in the U.S. and Taiwan, I believe, acknowledging its conviction and the remedial steps that it was taken. And when I first read about this, it reminded me of that medieval punishment where convicts were uh, marched through the market and required to wear a placard of shame that explained what they had done that was wrong. Why did the government feel that this punishment was necessary? For the very same reasons that Judge Ilson just laid out, this was as much as, yes, we did have some consciousness of bill evidence. It absolutely was a, a, a way of practice, a way of business practice throughout Asia. We saw that uh, early in the DRAM cases, and we felt that the DRAM cases had made some effect. We saw that in the meeting notes. They started to become aware of if you're going to engage with the U.S., uh, you cannot collude on pricing, on output, but it wasn't clearly enough to have those DRAM convictions. And we wanted to make sure that people understood that if you're going to engage with the U.S. economy, you cannot engage in collusion with your competitors uh, in any way. And the way to do that was to put out this information in the community where AUO was headquartered. And it is part of the sentencing guidelines. It is something, maybe it goes back to medieval times, and not, but it, it is in the sentencing guidelines that this is a provision that, that you can take. Uh, so we, of course, asked for it, Judge Ilston, and, and Judge Ilston went ahead and went forward with that. And I don't know, Brent, if you have any information on how that ended up playing out, because I don't. I don't remember. What I remember is the sentencing argument, and Heather was arguing for this, which I think there's some, these are sometimes called shaming provisions. Heather was arguing for it, and it struck me that Judge Ilston was skeptical. She maybe wasn't initially inclined, 
to, to grant this. But then she turned to AUO's counsel and asked for their response. And essentially it was, we shouldn't have to do this because we think all of this is getting overturned on appeal. And I distinctly remember Judge Ilston immediately pivoting to Heather and saying, how many publications do you want it in? <laughs> and so that really stood out in my mind. But I also think it shows, I think, the difficulty that a defendant that gets convicted at trial that believes they have appellate rights, how do you handle that sort of a situation? I think maybe the way they did it there was a little bit too aggressive, but I also understand them not wanting to concede something when it was going up in their mind was going up on appeal. Just as a completely different aside, I had another criminal defendant in a case who was once sentenced to write a book where as part of his sentence, and I think the judge had it in mind, the person would be very contrite and talk about what they learned from the process and all of that. And all I took away from the book is that they that person did not like me at all. That was the big takeaway from the book. Sometimes these shaming provisions can work, and maybe they don't. I don't know. Judge Ilston, you went along with the this recommendation. What was your thinking there? And I'm curious, have you imposed a similar sentence again after this case? No, I have not. And Heather's absolutely right. I was, or Brent, I was skeptical of this. And I'll tell you why. We had an experience in our court on a smaller scale where one of our judges had ordered a criminal defendant to, uh, maybe he had stolen mail from the post office. So they, he ordered that the defendant walk with a sign on his chest saying, I'm a mail thief and walk back and forth in front of the post office for some period of time. That had been overturned by the Ninth Circuit in a hot second. This was not something that I was accustomed to seeing done. Uh, and it is possible that the sequence of events was as suggested, that the argument by the other side catapulted, uh, what is it, defeat into the jaws of victory or vice versa, I'm not sure. But that is certainly possible. But of course, throwing open the idea that it could all be reversed on appeal, I figured then how can't, how bad would it be if I make them do this? Because if it's all going to be tossed on appeal, so be it. But it's not my favorite. It's not my favorite remedy. But I, I thought the idea of having a compliance monitor was far more effective. Anna, on trust and trade, we like to wrap with a few key takeaways for practitioners. And I'd like to give each of our guests who play such pivotal roles in this landmark case uh, an opportunity to share their own. Heather, let's start with you. I think for me, it was exactly what Judge Ilson was talking about in terms of the jury instructions. I think the, her willingness to engage with the jury instructions early in the case was really important to us. We actually briefed FTAIA and overcharge almost at the motion and lemonade phase, maybe even a little bit before that, actually because we needed to understand what the law was so that we could put on our case. And in my experience, where you have these novel issues with judge, judges after Judge Olson, the refusal to engage on jury instructions until the charge conference, meaning after the case has been tried, has been really difficult for defense and for the prosecution in order to figure out exactly how, what do we need to hit in order to make sure we're satisfying the, the JIs at the end. So. I was really happy that we were able to do that in this case. And I think it's what made it so strong too, such that when we were brought up on appeal on these very same issues, the Ninth Circuit firm Judge Olson very quickly on those rulings because they were clearly well substantiated. And then also as, as it went through the trial, we all did our level best to make sure that we were hewing very closely to the jury instructions. Patrick? Um, my takeaway is, from the trial defense standpoint, and it's to never stop investigating. Um, the week of trial, one of the cooperating defendants who, or co-defendants who had testified twice against other defendants agreed to meet with us. And he, from one of the other companies, and he basically said in that meeting, you know what, I didn't really agree with Richard By on prices. Say what you want about the other people but I didn't make an agreement with him. And to me, that was a key that unlocked the defense for him. He then set it on the stand and 
it was difficult for the government to fix that. And it played a central role in our closing. Brent? I think for me, it's really what that case should say about the other types of cases that the antitrust division brings in the future. As Judge Olson said, it's going to be rare to ever see a case that has this much evidence, this much strong evidence again in the future. But the antitrust division's trials, the trials that they've won in the past, usually feature a lot of this type of evidence. And what we have seen some in recent years is that they've strayed away from trying cases or indicting cases that have some of the things that you really need to see to win one of these cases in front of a jury. Multiple witnesses who will say there was an agreement, consciousness of guilt evidence, usually some sort of strong victim testimony. And like looking back and thinking about this case compared to some cases that have been subsequently brought and have not turned out well for the division, I think looking back at some of these cases, this would not be the only case by any means that they should be looking at as a guide to what you need to see in a case to win one in front of a jury. I have two takeaways from this, and it's from the point of view of of my job, which is uh, on the judiciary side. One is that uh, I had long felt as a lawyer that it would be effective to have the same judge hear both criminal and civil sides of antitrust cases. And this was the first time in my experience as a judge that had happened, and I do think it was helpful. The, the meticulous preparation that the criminal trial evidenced and that I sat through and worked with through that side certainly informed how to handle all the hundreds of other civil cases that were out there. Now, the evidence in this case was strong and it was in writing, so that could be shared uh, with both sides of the fence, criminal and civil, but it was very helpful to me to be informed of, of both of those sides. So I do think that it's an efficient way to proceed to have one judge assigned to both the, the civil and the criminal in such, such circumstances. So that's one takeaway. The other was on the instructions. The This was, it was a difficult case because it was the foreign defendants and the United States consequences and the, and the special statute for foreign defendants that we had to deal with. And we did start early and talked about it often. But at the end of the day, the lawyers worked together to translate all of that into something the jury could understand in the instructions. And, and I was really pleased with those instructions, which led me to think, and it has proved to be true, that the antitrust division, not the antitrust division, but that the ABA antitrust committee could help the courts and help the system by working on understandable, clear jury instructions in antitrust cases. And the antitrust committee has done a wonderful job doing that. They brought in both plaintiff side and defense side lawyers. And I think that work has been really helpful to, to the court. And my first belief that could actually happen uh, came in the AUO cases when we, when we worked on the instructions. Well, Anna, this has been great. Uh, for those of us who are only familiar with the AUO case as a decision, I think it really brought it alive by hearing from the people who tried and presided over it. We're certainly looking forward to doing more of these types of episodes with Trial Practice Committee. Thanks, Anant. We're looking forward to that as well. We've got some other really interesting oral histories that we're working on. Great. Anna, again, thank you. And my thanks as well to Heather and Yango, Brent Snyder, Patrick Robbins, and Judge Ilston for sharing these extraordinary insights from one of the most significant cartel cases in recent U.S. history. To our listeners, be sure to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we'll see you next time on Trust and Trade.